you so much for having me in this uh, series. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to speak about a topic that is taking a lot of my time, which is uh, damage, damages claims in, in, uh, in the European Union and essentially against big tech companies. Um, uh, again, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, fashionable these days to declare your interest or lack of interest before uh, making a presentation. Uh, in my case, it's very simple. Um, we have decided, my colleagues and I, that we would not act for big tech companies. So um, we are not doing any work for uh, Google, Apple, Amazon and the likes. To the contrary, in fact, we help those companies and individuals that have uh, problems uh, with them. And um, uh, two years ago, not so long ago, we started um, considering collective action against uh, big tech companies. And at the moment, I'm involved in six uh, major actions. Uh, four in the UK, two in the Netherlands, and one in France, in fact, seven. But we have another few on uh, the back burner or in the pipeline, so there may be more uh, soon. So let me, let me discuss a few topics, I think, that I hope you will find interesting. Um, the first one is why private enforcement? Uh, why would you allow damages claims. I, I think it's essentially for two reasons. The first one is that um, um, it's, it's been considered uh, by uh, the European Court of Justice, but also by EU institutions generally that offering uh, damages to victims of anti-competitive behavior is something that is valuable. And uh, it is actually true. Um, if you uh, if you go, for example, against uh, Google uh, in the context of ad tech or in the context of the Play Store, um, it means that a lot of companies will receive uh, sizable damages. Um, I'm I'm a little bit more skeptical about consumer actions, and and personally, we're not. I'm not doing consumer actions because very often uh, what will happen is that the damages will be very low. Could be 10 pounds or 10 euros for someone who's been cheated by uh, Meta or, or, or Google. Um, and very often the damages are not claimed. Uh, the take up rate in consumer actions is very low it's rarely more than 10%. So that means that even if you obtain uh, damages, um, most consumers will not actually uh, uh, make use of, of the money. And then it will either go, go to a charity or go back to uh, the, the big tech company. So we've decided to stay away from that and to focus on business victims essentially users of these platforms. It can be large companies, but also uh, lots of smaller companies. In most of these actions, you have, you know, a few, a few relatively large businesses and then a very long tail, right? So, for example, in our action in the UK against Google on behalf of, of, of uh, publishers, we represent a class that is over uh, 100,000 uh, publishers. Uh, in that, you will have a few big ones like The Guardian, the FT, uh, The Telegraph. And then there's an extremely long tail of small publishers uh, that uh, are part of the class. In our action against the Apple App Store, uh, we've got a class of 13,000 app developers, in that you have about 300 uh, fairly large, although none of them is very large, but let's say fairly large app developers that will have claims, you know, uh, that are above, let's say, 250,000 pounds. 
and then we've got a long tail, you know, of 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 another twelve thousand and seven hundred developers that will have smaller claims. But if you look, for example, at developer, let's say fifteen hundred, it's still ten thousand pounds, right? So these are, uh, um, you know, sizable damages. The second reason is deterrence. Um, uh, so, for instance. If you look at our ad tech cases uh, in the Netherlands, we're looking uh, to recover 2.1 billion. And in the UK, we're looking at 13 billion. So I'm not suggesting we will necessarily have these damages. These are estimates and they're the best case scenario in case we win on all accounts. Uh, but it means that we're talking about uh, the kind of money that will make some companies think, especially because these actions, the similar actions take place in the UK, in the Netherlands, uh, in Australia, uh, but also in the United States. So it piles up and very often they come on top uh, fines uh, by competition authorities. So if you look, for example, at ad tech, which is a sector uh, in which Google is has been subject to multiple investigations and lawsuits, uh, the total cost could be up to 20 billion. Uh, so that's the sort of money that even Google will care about. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the different forms of collective actions. Um, you know, the, the, the most important distinction is between opt-in and opt-out. Um, opt-in means that to be part of the action, a business needs to sign up to the action, right? Uh, so it's a voluntary step. Uh, and typically then, uh, the lawyers will create a special purpose vehicle to aggregate the claims, and this is this vehicle that will sue uh, the target. Um, it means that it requires a lot of work to put these actions together because you need to recruit. Uh, essentially, you need to go to the companies, very often with the help of trade associations, to convince them to join the action. And it's basically a year of work. So it's extremely time consuming. In the Netherlands, uh, uh, in our case against Google, we represent 34 um, publishers that tend to be fairly large publisher. It includes Axel Springer, uh, DBH Media, Sanoma, Shipstead and the likes. And it took us one year to get to that point because these people will have questions and so on. Opt out is much easier because then everybody's in the class except if they decide to opt out. So that is why in the UK we have classes that can be up to um, 200 thousand the largest class we have is in a case against Amazon where we represent uh, third-party sellers using the Amazon platform and we've got our estimate is that we've got 211,000 of them okay could be more could be less but it's an estimate and of course if someone if a seller doesn't want to be part of the action once the action is certified, they have a period of several months to opt out. Now, two of our class actions have been certified and we, haven't, we have not lost in any uh, members of the class. Why? Because why would you opt out? What's not to like about the class action? It doesn't cost you anything. And, um, you know, you may receive a check in some cases, you know, it could be millions or dozens of millions without doing anything. I will explain why it doesn't cost anything in a minute. Okay. 
Uh, but this is really uh, a big distinction and it, it's very relevant because in the UK, you've got the choice between opt-out and opt-in. In continental Europe, the regimes are opt-in regimes. So it's much harder to put together these actions because you need to recruit uh, participants and it's not easy. Another country where you have um, an opt-out regime is Portugal, and uh, there is a particularly active uh, litigant in Portugal. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Lisbon, and he created literally a cottage industry of collective actions against uh, big companies because the opt-out regime is actually quite favorable. Now, again, to make distinctions, uh, another important distinction is the difference between follow-on and standalone action. So a follow-on action is an action that follows on the decision of a competition uh, authority. Um, there, there are a lot of follow-on actions um, in the cartel space. Um, in the context of platforms, uh, we can also see follow-on actions, but fewer of them because of two reasons. First of all, there are relatively few decisions. Okay, there's some big decisions by the European Commission, some also by the Bundeskartelamt and the French Competition Authority. Um, and very often these decisions are actually um, um, de de decisions focusing on exclusionary conduct, whereas many uh, of the claims are uh, exploitative ones where we will seek to demonstrate that uh, they exploited their market power uh, by overcharging users or undercompensating users, because it can go in both directions. So follow-on is easy, because then you can go to a tribunal and say, okay, there has been an infringement, I don't need to prove it. It's all about damages. So, you know, it's it's an easy one. I, I mean, all, 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 of course, you need to show quantum, which is tricky, and, and I, I, I'll speak to that in a minute. Uh, but from a legal standpoint, these are the easiest cases because you don't need to prove liability. Um, standalone is a different game. Standalone is basically you um, considering there has been an abuse of some sort, and you need to prove it. So uh, it, it's a greater degree of complexity because you need to uh, uh, actually prove that an abuse has been committed, uh, and uh, you, yeah, you you basically hold the burden of proof. So it's it's more difficult. It's of course not impossible, and. Most of the actions in which I'm involved are standalone actions, uh, or it's it's a mix of standalone and uh, and and follow-on. For example, in my case against Amazon in the UK, we rely on uh, several decisions, but these are not UK decisions, so they don't bind the Competition Appeals Tribunal. Uh, but obviously they provide uh, some interesting evidence of wrongdoing that we are uh, trying to uh, play on. So these are, I think, two important distinctions, opt-out versus opt-in, follow-on versus standalone. Now, as I mentioned, uh, in, in most of these cases, you have to decide who you are representing. Are you representing consumers or business users? And it's an important decision because, uh, in fact, these are, t these are platforms and, and these are two-sided platforms, right? I mean, if you look at Amazon, you've got uh, the people buying stuff on Amazon and you have people selling stuff on Amazon. If you think about the App Store, you've got people 
don't, I mean, downloading apps from the app store and using apps, and you have people that are distributing apps on, on the app store. As I said, um, I think historically most actions were consumer actions. Uh, there's a law firm very famous for doing that. It's Osfeld. But uh, because we want to be impactful, um, we decided to do um, uh, actions on behalf of business victims because then the damages are much more meaningful and the findings are also more meaningful. So this is our area of focus and we like that. Typically, in the UK, you've got parallel cases. You will have a consumer case and a business case running in parallel. And then we're typically friends, except on one issue that I will discuss later, which is pass on. Because obviously, the consumer class will say that they've overpaid because of pass on, whereas uh, my class you know, we'll say, no, there's no pass on or very little pass on because we had to absorb these costs. And so that means that typically we're friends with the other side until pass on where suddenly we're no longer friends. And it's, it's pass on is a very fascinating question uh, I, can, I can talk about. So let me now move to the dynamics of these actions. Uh, there is something that I didn't know until I got involved in this, which is you cannot do actions without um, litigation funding. So there's an industry um, um, of, which, which started in the United States and now it, it has uh, also uh, uh, developed in the UK and in a more limited way in, in the European uh, Union of financial uh, institutions investing in litigation. And these are um, uh, either hedge funds. So for example, Elliott, who's a very big American hedge fund, is active in that space. Fortress is active in that space. And then you have uh, institutions that basically raise funds from investors to, um, to um, invest in these cases. The first case I did uh, was funded by um, Ivy League universities. Uh, it's a funder that basically manages some of the money some of the endowments of Harvard and Yale and Columbia. And, um, you know, uh, uh, these institutions like to invest in litigation funding because it's, it's not correlated to the stock market. So it's one way to diversify uh, your investments. And, and so typically they will invest in, in the stock, in bonds, in whatever venture, and then uh, litigation funding can be one type of investment that they will use to diversify and de-risk, you know, investment in stock, for example. So it's really quite interesting. Um, you really need them because litigating against big tech is very expensive. It is ridiculously expensive. Um, a case in the UK before the Competition Appeal Tribunal uh, requires at the minimum £20 million, but it can go up, up to £40 million. And a case on the continent will typically require uh, 10 million euro. Um, why is it so expensive? Let me give you a few reasons. First of all, the UK is, is, is very expensive for two reasons. One is that you've got two types of lawyers. You have people like me uh, and you have the barristers and the barristers are extremely expensive. So there's a duplication, in fact, and the second reason why it's expensive is because 
the losing party pays. So if you sue Google and you lose, well, you lose not only your legal fees, but you have to pay for uh, uh, the Google fees, which because these guys have no uh, <laughs> budget, if I could say so, could be very high. So we need to spend a lot of money in buying after the event insurance. And typically, this will be £5 million, pounds, for example. It's not uh, exceptional. So if you look at... And, and then experts are very expensive. I, I'm, I'm sure you will not be surprised that economics experts are very expensive. And... There's a reason for that, which is that a typical expert report uh, in a case like this can run into hundreds of pages. Um, these cases involve a lot of data as well. And so uh, it's a lot of hard work and, and you're facing incredibly well-resourced uh, litigants. Um, if you have, you know, a team of, of, of 20, they will have a team of 50. So that means that no matter what you spend, you will be outgunned by these people. On the continent, it's less expensive because generally legal services are less expensive on the continent. And then uh, each side will, will pay its own costs. Okay. So you don't have this aftershock in case of loss that you need to cover uh, the expenses, the expenses uh, of, of the company you have, you have sued. So the model for these funders is that they take a percentage uh, of the damages, typically in the range of 20 to 25%, or a multiple of their investment. So they can say, well, if I invest, let's say, 25 million in the case, I will take 5x my investment. Hmm? Uh, wh why do they take these big percentages or multiples? It's because it's a very risky activity. You, you, you know, uh, it, it, and, and it lasts for a long time. The first major case in the UK is Merricks, which is a case against credit card companies. And it started nine years ago, and it's not over yet. Okay. So in before the competition appeals tribunal, you have about 50 claims and only one judgment. So uh, it, it, it takes a lot of time. Why? Because you're facing uh, companies that will try to make it difficult for you, uh, that will try to delay things and raise your costs. Uh, so uh, funders need, if you want funding, they these guys, uh, will 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 give you funding, but with big returns. There is a growing uh, interest in funding by the CAT uh, because they want to avoid uh, excessive returns. But uh, to me, this is not necessarily the right debate for two reasons: is that even if uh, the funding agreement says that you will take five x. Um, uh, first of all, any amount needs to be uh, accepted by the CAT. So your funding agreement, if you say 5x, it doesn't mean you'll get 5x. Maybe you'll end up with 3x. And secondly, it's always based on in undistributed damages. So the funder will pay itself on damages that are not claimed. Okay. Which means that this is why historically they prefer consumer actions because consumers are less likely to claim their damages than businesses. Of course, if you've got a very long tail of small businesses, it's more likely than not that they will uh, uh, they they will most likely not collect uh, the check at the end of the case. But funding is is very important, and uh, without it, you can you can forget about it. Especially because in Europe, you cannot do contingency cases. It's not possible for lawyers to say, "I'm not charging anything, but I will take a percentage of the damages." We're not allowed to do that. Period. Uh, so we need someone to pay the bills at the end of every month, although we can receive success fees. Let me take now about the major venues. Where is this taking place? Well, 
The main venue at the moment is the Competition Appeal Tribunal in the UK. They've got about 50 collective actions in motion. Um, and the reason why you have uh, these, um, this, let's say, important uh, portfolio of cases in the UK is because funding is present in the UK. And because funders have some trust in the Competition Appeal Tribunal. I must say, having now litigating cases there, that the Competition Appeal Tribunal is the Rolls Royce of, uh, um, let's say, uh, competition litigation. Um, it's extremely serious. Um, this, these cases are very carefully managed. And then you've got a proper trial with witnesses, uh, discovery, and everything. So, for example, a typical trial will be 10 weeks. Uh, by contrast, the other extreme is the Tribunal de Commerce, the, 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 the business court in, in Paris, where the trial is four hours. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, for uh, for people to, to want to do a collective action, uh, you, you know, having a four hour trial uh, is is not is not looking good. And I can confirm because I've just been involved in 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 uh, in, in a damages case in France and uh, the Tribunal de Commerce, which is populated by uh, lay. Uh, uh, men and women, uh, business people who don't necessarily have a law degree, is really a kangaroo court. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but it's a big joke. Uh, whereas it, the Competition Appeal Tribunal, um, it's a panel of three judges, um, many of them uh, with significant competition experience, uh, a, either as judges or academics, or uh, people who retired from their law firm. And so you're really facing people who know what they're doing. Uh, some of them are PhD economists as well. So in our case against Google, we have, for example, someone who's got a PhD from MIT, as in an, and she's an auction specialist, which is, of course, uh, wonderful because she can, she can really pose the right questions. Amsterdam is also a big uh, venue for collective actions. This is due to jurisdiction because uh, the Amsterdam courts are willing to consider damages for the whole EU 27. So not only for damages that were incurred in the Netherlands, but also uh, in, uh, in the rest of the European uh, Union. Uh, and that, of course, is something that is attractive uh, because uh, you can um, you can kill uh, many birds with one stone. I mean, of course, litigating in twenty seven countries is is very expensive and it's not efficient. Whereas, in fact, if you've got a claim that, uh, um, you know, has a broad scope, which is typically the case if you sue Google and Apple, for example, because, or Amazon, because they're present everywhere, right? And their practices do not change. The App Store is the same in Greece as it is in, in Germany or in Italy. So it's extremely efficient to litigate in the, in the Netherlands. And the courts are really quite good. They know what they're doing. Uh, these are professional judges uh, with, by now, significant experience. Other places are Portugal because of the opt-out. Spain is becoming uh, a country where you have a fairly large number of cases. France, but France is, is a problem because of, uh, of, the, of the business court, um, which is which is not really ideal uh, for these sort of complicated cases. Germany uh, is also uh, a, a case, a, a, a jurisdiction where you see cases, but not many compared to the size of the country. And I think uh, one of the problem is indeed that the courts are not really suited to the exercise. 
um, and the damages that have been so far obtained are not necessarily seen as material. So um, I, I'm, I'm, that being said, I'm not really aware of what's going on in Germany because I've never done a case in, in Germany, but we took an interest in Germany at some stage and we were not particularly encouraged uh, doing cases uh, there. Although this may be changing, of course. Um, let me now speak about key issues. So what are the key issues that are uh, discussed at trial? One, of course, is jurisdiction. Uh, it's, it's a key question. And I will tell, give you an example of last week why it's a key question. So um, my colleagues and I uh, represented a company called Equatif. It's a small French ad tech intermediary. It's a company with about 100 people and a direct competitor of Google. And Google basically destroyed them uh, and essentially ruined their business. Now, because the French Competition Authority adopted a decision finding that Google had committed an abuse, they decided to go to court. And, um, and they were asking 360 million euros in damages. Um, um, 360 was a, a large amount compared to the size of the company. But of course, you always ask a little bit more than you think you will obtain. Eventually, they obtain only 19.6 million. Why? It's because most of the damages were suffered outside France, right? Um, ad tech intermediaries, they're active everywhere, right? It's not something that is limited to uh, a given jurisdiction, and so the bulk of the damages, and but the court said that they were not competent to uh, uh, grant damages outside France, which is flatly wrong. It's a complete misinterpretation of European law and the uh, Sumal judgment of the Court of Justice. And so we're appealing, and we think we will win on appeal because it's such a gross mistake that uh, there is... Uh, I think, uh, a very high chance of that judgment being overturned. But even the UK, typically, you know, they will be a, a jurisdiction challenge with uh, the targets of the case claiming that you don't have jurisdiction for the whole or at least a part of your action. So that's why it's important to really select the right place to do your case, because if you screw up on jurisdiction, well, you may be kicked out uh, immediately. You need, of course, a strong theory of harm, especially in standalone cases. So a lot of the work we do, my colleagues and I, is um, the work that a traditional competition authority would do which is to build a case showing uh, that uh, uh, some uh, that the, the, the class you represent suffered harm due to uh, uh, various anti-competitive behavior. Here, I should make a distinction between two types of jurisdiction, those where you can obtain discovery, like the US and the UK and those where you cannot obtain discovery, like continental Europe. And that's a big difference, because if you have the burden of proof, discovery or disclosure, as they call it in the UK, is essential. So in a UK case, at some stage, we may collect millions of documents and a ton of data, um, which is really key. Uh, whereas if you litigate in the Netherlands and in France, you have very, 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 very little access to uh, the documents and the data you need. So you basically need to make it up uh, using approximations and these sort of things. But it's, it's very hard to show the burden of proof. It's easier, of course, if, if, if it's follow on. Now, 
you know, one of the reasons why a lot of our actions are also not follow-on is because we find the competition authorities too timid or too lazy or not liking to do certain type of cases. For example, typically, and you know that, uh, yeah. competition authorities detest exploitative cases. And to be honest, there is no reason why that should be the case. Uh, exploitation is part of the EU treaty. It's Article 102A. And I don't see why uh, antitrust authorities should stay away from them. And to some extent, it's changing. Um, in the Apple case, the App Store case, uh, the theory of arm of the Commission is exploitative. Um, in the case in in France against Google, the theory of arm was exploitative. And very often it revolves around unfair terms, right? Because um, the contracts with platforms are what we call in French a decent contract. That means they are, they are take or leave it. Very often they contain terms that are totally unacceptable and would never be accepted by the counterpart of these platforms if they were negotiated on an arm's length basis. So um, very often we find terms that are unfair and we sue on that basis. Um, and that's another reason why I, I think private enforcement is important is that there are lots of cases that competition authorities do not do, either because they don't want to do the case or because they don't have enough resources. And um, I, I think I can share that. I suppose if he were in this call, he would not uh, hate me for doing that. But I was speaking recently with Andrea Coscelli, who, who used to be the, 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 the chairman of the uh, uh, CMA in the UK, he's a, he's a well-known economist, as you know, and he was telling me that, that he thinks there's a lot of under-enforcement uh, and that he was frustrating himself because he could only do a small amount of cases because of uh, a lack of bandwidth. Uh, these cases are extremely uh, uh, demanding, uh, and uh, and and uh, he, he was struggling to find the resources to do just a handful of cases every year. If you look at the European Commission, these cases are very rare. What do you have in the pipeline at the moment at the Commission? You you have the Google App Tech, and you've got the Facebook Marketplace. That's it. I'm not aware of any other case against big tech that is pending before the Commission. So uh, we need courageous people to be uh, uh, to take risks on these cases, uh, including losing their time and their shirt in some cases, um, because otherwise a lot of infringement will not be challenged. Uh, so I think there is a very useful policy role. And to be honest, after uh, uh, doing uh, 25 years of competition law, I decided I was I wanted to focus on on the sort of cases that competition authorities would not do, or most law firms would not do because they're uh, you know in bed typically with the biggest firms. <laughs> so I wanted to be on the other side of these things. So theory of arm is important. It's a lot of the case. The trial will be about market definition, dominance, theory of arm, uh, counterfactuals, and so on. Quantum. Quantum is, of course, it's about damages. So quantum is essential. And, and quantum is, is a complicated exercise for economists. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to them and, 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 and sort of trying to frame the case. And how do you calculate quantum is through a counterfactual. So typically, the, the, you build a counterfactual, which is the world in which the abuse would not have been committed. And then you look at the extent to which the victims would be better off. So for example, in the App Store cases, you look 
at a world in which um, the App Store and the Play Store would not have a monopoly of distribution and would face competition with, for example, an impact on the commissions they take. You could argue that in a competitive world, uh, because app stores need to have apps, right? Otherwise, uh, there would not be any app store. The fees could be very, very low. And if you had five uh, app store competing for uh, app developers, the fees could even be negative. Uh, this is what happened with Microsoft and Huawei, which at some point were actually subsidizing app developers because uh, uh, without app developers, you, you, you cannot have a, a, a viable ecosystem. And these, in these cases, you, you can actually not sell devices. So, uh, you know, these fat commissions of 30%, uh, they only reflect market power. There's not a world in which, uh, um, um, you know, uh, in the presence of competition, um, a, a simple intermediation activity would command uh, a 30% commission. So quantum is, uh, is an interesting exercise. And once you have met your burden of proof, uh, or if it's a follow-on case, well, then uh, the discussion will be about uh, quantum. Then another issue that is very interesting is pass on. Uh, Pass-on is an issue on which economists can uh, spend a very large amount of time in Merix. But Merix is a crazy case because it's the first case. So all theories are tested in Merix. Merix is the guinea pig of, of damages claim, at least in the, in the UK. Uh, the trial on Passon took 10 weeks, which is completely ridiculous. I mean, you know, you, you would never wish to spend 10 weeks on this, but it's tricky. It's very tricky. Um, um, I think one week would have been sufficient to deal with it, but it, it, it's tricky. And of course, uh, if you have the two sides of the platform that are, uh, uh, you know, claiming damages, obviously, um, the consumers will need to show pass on and uh, they will use a variety of economic techniques, as you know, to demonstrate the presence of, of pass on, uh, which, is, which, which is interesting. It's, it's complicated because if you think about it, uh, think about the app store. You've got multiple different categories of apps, right? Um, uh, you have news apps, you have dating apps, you have gaming apps, and the market is not necessarily the same, right? I mean, market power, if you're a monopolist in a sector, well, then there's typically uh, a no pass on, right? Um, or, or the opposite. <laughs> I'm confused. But anyway, you know, it varies, whereas it's very, if it's very competitive, well, it, there is a pass on. Uh, because, you know, uh, 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 you need to pass on the cost, otherwise you just go bust. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting issue that is absor uh, absorbing a lot of time. So let me pause here. I think I've covered uh, most of the hot topics. Mm -hmm.